The reason why celebrative leadership is not a usual, is a not a usual thing. Number one, it is because man likes to be king. And when you celebrate my leadership, it means you are thinking I'm great. Yeah. So I might be greater than, so that the simple word in, we use is called jealousy. Am I communicating? <laughs> yeah. Even if it's your own son, your son has just got first class honors. And you tell him, yeah, because it is these, these days. In our days, to get up per second was a big thing. <laughs> now you are playing down on your son's first class. Because you have just said, ah, these teachers of yours are always drinking. In our time, we were taught by Gogo and Yongo. They were serious people. <laughs> they did not just give anybody a first class. Now, you are refusing to celebrate. Am I right? And that might make your son not go high. You mean, because your son thought he is clever. But when he is told he is only clever because the teachers are foolish. Now, you just understand it. <laughs> so the first reason why we don't celebrate is jealousy. Are we together? And until, my friend, you conquer jealousy, you will not be able to celebrate others. Number two reason why people uh, do not celebrate is because of what I call scarcity mentality. Scarcity mentality says that there isn't enough for everyone. Like especially those of us who grew up in the 19, I was, I grew up in the 1950s. And the, in the days of Mahmoud and emergency, food was scarce. You know that word IDP we learned the other day. All of us in Tobago were IDPs. You know what? Internally displaced persons, because all of us were put into villages out of our, the place you used to stay. And so it was very difficult life. The little food you got between how much you had your stomach depended on your speed. <laughs> <laughs> so children just grabbed it. It's called scarcity mentality, where you feel like there isn't going to be enough. Therefore, I must grab. Now, how will you go celebrating others when you are planning how to dethrone them? Are you getting my point? <laughs> so, even if it's your junior, you think if he's doing that well, I have no job. The day the MD recognizes him, he be too poor, huh? because you think in your own mind, he cannot do well, and you do well. Not knowing that that boy is not intending to get your job. The reason he's doing so well is because he's applying for a job in Switzerland. Not you are a small job. <laughs> but you see, in your mind, you think only of your company. But this guy is looking at all the companies in the world, in China, in a, I'm not communicating. Yeah. So, if you have the potential mentality, rather than the scarcity mentality, you are able to recognize people because you know they don't all have to stay in your small place. So you keep encouraging them. Do you agree with me that if you have scarcity mentality, you cannot want to celebrate other people? Yeah. For that reason as to why it is difficult for you to have celebration. In addition to the ones I've just, just, uh, just talked about, is the very fact that when you celebrate, when you celebrate people, you fear, you never, you believe that anybody praised will stop working well. So this one is a better reason. <laughs> but there are people who believe that, if, and there's a kiku saying like that, I'm not really interpreting it into English, but there's a kiku saying like that, Mugano, now, let me not go into Kikuyu. But uh, the person who is praised never arrives where he is going. Is that, that a, a, a Kikuyu philosophy that is completely against celebration leadership? Now, my, our teacher, you here? <laughs> you are up against a philosophy of life. Where you do not praise somebody, because if you praise him, he cannot go where he is. So even when you see your son doing well, you don't tell him. Iriasiwena. So if you believe that, then you can never, you can never celebrate anybody. Because you, you love them too much to allow them to fail. And since you don't want them to fail, you don't thank them, you don't acknowledge them. You know, even if your wife, your wife is dressing very well, she might stop dressing well if you praise her. So you don't keep telling her that dress is good. She might stop buying them. Now, so if that is your philosophy, do you see you cannot celebrate other people? No. I could go on, but I promise you three years a day. Now, so all I'm saying is, and I wanted to emphasize so that you understand every C is important, that anybody without celebration, his performance will reach level A, but cannot go to A+. plus. There is a limitation, because if you are not able to thank people, they tend not to do well. When you thank them, thanklessly, you know, continuously. In other words, you're not waiting for any stoppage. 
they will keep doing better and better and better. And since you are working as a team, the team will do far much better than originally would have happened when everybody is celebrated. Some of them are crooks, but you look for what they do well. Now, <laughs> and you tell them, I know you are crook number three, but please <laughs> understand that this team, without your contribution here and here, you know, everybody just talks about them being crooks, but you know, even the worst crook in your team, if you check, there is something well good he does. So, but you are planted, you might have to get a PhD on him to accurately <laughs> get what it is he is doing well. But when you get it, do you know the guy changes? How did the teachers manage boys who are bad? They made them prefect, isn't it? <laughs> and all of a sudden, one higher. Ah, you mean I'm that good? I can be a prefect. The guy changes. Did you hear about that? <laughs> Did you hear those stories? That is celebration, isn't it? Now, so you need to start understanding, which is my next, my next mention in the conclusion of the morning session, that celebrative leadership is a leadership that allows the people to ab perform about above their potential. In other words, the guy is going beyond because how much you are encouraging him. So can you see why you must change your leadership style and start recognizing people, including, I repeat, the groups of your team. You must look at what it is that he does well. We move now from that level, go to the next C, which is collaborative leadership. And we argue that people who cannot celebrate others are unlikely to want to collaborate with others. You know, I still remember, remember I was in Kisumu in the 80s, and we called, um, somebody called um, uh, Bonke. Ever heard of Bonke? Yeah, he's a, he was at least in the 80s, 90s, he was quite famous in Nairobi. And I was in the committee organizing his, his crusades in Kisumu town, because that's where I was, that's where I was, I was living. And I happened to know the, the one, the African head of, of his mission in Kenya. So when he came, he told, hey, you must help us. So I got involved. And I can never forget the person, the pastor we made chairman of the follow-up committee. And we were all preparing the materials, how the people that got, because the crusade was going to run almost a week. It was doing many days. And he wanted every evening, whoever filled the decision card, we start planting them in churches. But then, since there are many participating churches, you need to ask someone who has gotten saved, which church do you come from? And then you are supposed to take all cards for that particular church, Anglican, or that particular church, PAG, or that particular church, you are supposed to take them to the people in that church to follow up their members. So as the thing was starting, the chairman of the follow-up committee asked, are you telling me, he was a Pentecostal, are you telling me to get saved and I send them to America? Yes. <laughs> he could argue in the open, but that follow-up never worked. Collaboration. If collaboration means enriching the right? he is a Pentecostal and he started filling up a little churches. Not him. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he never died. All the cards got lost. Because you see, when you do the <laughs> So when you talk about collaboration, it's not an easy matter. When you, all you want is your church to be full. But you see, collaboration was so that you bring all churches together and enrich all churches. But he did not think all churches. He wanted all people who got saved, now that he's a follow-up guy, he's allowed to take all of them into his own church. And obviously there are so many people saved, because you cannot even cope with them. By the time we discovered, I think on the third night, that nothing was happening to the car, we went to we went to MTC, got students together, tried to train them quickly to start allocating their cards. Because the chairman was not available. He said, the idea is to send people to such places. <laughs> Count me out. <laughs> now, so when we are talking about the transformational leadership, we are saying you must go above the level of yourself to see good in others. So that you see what they are contributing and what you are contributing, and you see yourself as able to contribute much more when you work together. That's what you are talking about. Collective leadership is building strategic alliances for synergy. Okay, we can even add the course from there. 
What you are saying is, what is energy? Anybody can help us with what is energy? This is a word you normally use. Who, who can tell us what energy is? Yes? Joining hands. So energy is joining hands. Another one? Another way of looking at energy? That's one way. An explosive result. Yeah, extraordinary result. Extraordinary result. Yeah, that's another way adding to the previous another one. So sorry, somebody else, yes? Sorry? Pulling it. Say Naja is pulling the same direction. Again for explosive results. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Energy of operation. Energy of operation. Of cooperation. So what you are saying, corruptive relationship is building strategic alliances. It means that it's not just an alliance. You start working with anybody. You choose who to work with. That's one of the things that's important about collaboration. Collaboration is just working together. Collaboration is working with the people you have selected because of your purpose. In other words, you know I'm going here. Who else is going with me? Or oh, even him. Even him. You are strategically looking for people who can help you reach your strategic intent as an organization. And when you're talking about collaboration, you're not just talking about collaboration about indiv between individuals. We're also talking about collaboration between groups. And we are saying you must build strategic analysis. Why? Because they will give you synergy. What is synergy? Synergy, like we have said, is the result that is higher from collaboration. Because you collaborate. So, for example, if I'm able to lift 10 pounds. But because Justice Musinga is stronger than me, which he is not, but uh, let, us, <laughs> let us assume he is stronger than me, he is able to pick 20 pounds. So on his own, he will lift 20. On my own, I will lift 10. So between us, we lift 30. Synergy says that we will not produce the total sum. We will produce an extra. So when you do it separately, it will be 30. When we do it together, we will do that a five. Five is synergy. Are you getting my point? What you get as a higher result because of working together. And that's really what we are here this afternoon to discuss. People, some people don't believe in synergy. <laughs> because, because for them, they are okay. They can work on their own. Now if we can lift 20, why does he need, need a week in now with only 10? I'm okay. But when you discover the secret behind this energy, even if you are lifting 20 and I'm lifting 10, you realize between us, we will leave that the 5 divided even on a proper ratio. You know, he, it means that he must get um, what, two thirds, he must get two thirds of the, of the total. So the extra 5, you go with 3 and I go with 2. So I end up now producing 12 and you end up producing 23. So I said he gained. Okay, he has gained more than me, but we have all gain. That's what we are here to discuss this afternoon. And we are asking that without this seed of collaboration, you will never become transformational. You take over your leadership, you want to go somewhere, you can only go up to here. If you work with others, you will go a little more. So if you want to be a transformational leader, you must decide, deliberately decide to work with others who are going to a similar uh, direction. So, we shall be covering the question of what is collaborative leadership. We shall also talk about finding other organizations that complement the mission, vision, values, and strategies of objective, how to select them, how to create win-win situations, how to negotiate areas of competing interest between us, because when we work together, we will not agree on everything. After all, that's why we are two separate organizations, and that must be correct. <coughs> We are also going to talk about how to maintain healthy relationship with others. Because there may not be total agreement. How do you <coughs> agree to disagree? That will mean it's healthy. On that particular issue, we will not work together. How do you maintain right relationship with the competitors and opponents? Avoiding collision in commercial bending. Because you see what we are going to be saying in a minute is that in this synergy, you could also break the law. Because you are, you are synergizing in order to, to, to break the Price Control Act. Are you getting the point? Yeah. And that, that, okay, you may produce more in jail. Now, so... <laughs> <laughs>
So if you don't want to go to jail, it will be important that you check out that you are, you are not colluding in commercial building. And how do you live in peace and in loyal position? In other words, you are opposing each other. Because like I'm saying, you are collaborating on certain things, on certain other things you are not collaborating. And how do you cultivate proper multipartisan chip and negotiate conflict solution and reconciliation? Because when you disagree, how are you going to, uh, to read that now? And at the end of this, we are hoping by, the, by before 5 o'clock that participants will identify potential allies. They may be in this room. Some of them may be in your head. But I'm hoping by, the, by 5 o'clock, you start saying, yes, this is what I feel God has called me to do. This is what my organization is called to do. Have I ever thought of this as an organization? How are we collaborating? Or are we just competing? So I'm hoping by 5 o'clock, you will have identified somebody. Then you investigate potential answers with other participants. You are, those are here. And then you identify next steps to organizational conflict solution. How, if you are going to collaborate, how do you, you resolve conflict? Um, beyond the seminar, participants are inspired and equipped with basic tools for building strategic alliances. I hope we'll, by the end of the day you see, yeah, this is how I can build strategic alliances. Ever heard of this saying? Travel alone and you'll be fast. But travel together and you'll go far. That if you really want to go fast, don't collaborate. You're always faster alone than with somebody else. Have you discovered that? Yeah, that if you really if you really want, like my wife and I walk for exercise, and when I, I see she doesn't normally keep to my speed, <laughs> the day we are walking together, I know that there's a place we walk which is about 440 kilometers. Ah, not meters, not kilometers. We can't make 400 meters. And I, I cover it, I normally cover it in four, three to four minutes on my own. When she comes, it's five minutes. So I feel like she's slowing me down. But you know something? When I do it alone, because I like to do about 12 rounds, that gives me something like six kilometers. When, I'm able, when, I, when, I, when I do that, I'm able to finish it before one hour, the six kilometers before one hour. We start going with her, and it certainly take five, one whole hour or a little more. But you know what happens? When you walk with her, you walk slowly. But by the end of the six kilometers, I can go for a seven one. Somehow, I'm enjoying the talk. You know, all the stories she has forgotten to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow, we finish five kilometers, and you can't tell we are walking. And we start asking, how many have we done? We have actually got to look at the watch in order to be sure how many we have done. But when I'm alone, I'm counting. <laughs> Two. I'm tired. We did not time. Now, so you need to understand the idea is, if you want to go far, don't go alone. If all you are after is speed, go alone. Remember a subject to transformational leadership. You are helping the group you are leading to go very, very far. For you to be able to go very far, then you must carry everyone, including the weak ones. Because those weak ones, there is a contribution they are giving that will help you to go have far-reaching consequences that are not possible with the people you call weaklings in the team. Every one of them is important to the team. If you want to go, far. But if you are all after speed, you keep dropping all those slow ones and you quickly finish. But you need to know about life. Life is not a hundred meter dash. Life is a marathon. Are we together? And you have seen marathon, the people who win them <coughs> normally corroborate. Have you seen that as Kenyans? Yes. Now you need to understand. hundred meter, there's no... Have you ever heard of hundred meter where they corroborate? <laughs> you think, and before you even know who is running, it's finished. Exactly. These days they are doing them in another 10 seconds, isn't it? Now, so there is no collaboration. <laughs> because you just take off at your speed. But in a marathon, you have to know how to collaborate. Now, what he's asking you is, as the leader of your group, as the leader of your department, as a leader of your community, are you in a hard meter dash or are you in a marathon? Do you want to see real changes? If you do, then we recommend that you form a team. And what is a team? A team is spelled T E uh, it's spelled T E A M. And it's short for together. Each achieves more. That's the meaning of the word team. Together, each achieves more. So if you don't want to join a team, you still achieve something, but not since you don't have that 
element called synergy. You will not get as much as you want. And so you will not be as transformational as you, you could have been. There's a short metaphor from Zimbabwe that says, a great physician does not heal himself. He needs others. Is that true? Yeah. In other words, the very best of us, the very best of us, there is a side of you that is not that good. Every one of us. And you know, that's one of the things in collaboration you must learn. That nobody in the team does not have a part that you don't have. That's why they are needed in the team. And you can't imagine, some of us are so gifted. When you look at the people around you, you wonder why do I need them? <laughs> we are saying, collaboration is recognizing that even the very least of them has something. But because most of us, for example, like those of us who are parents, and I can see many of us are, are parents here, we tend to think the child who is always number one in class is the one everybody, when the animals come, that is your brothers, you always say, hey, look at your mother now, assuming you, you have named their mother. She was number one in class. At that time, there's another child who was number one from the back, and nobody talks about them, because you are just praising the one who was number one from the front. <laughs> now, what do you think the other children are feeling? Three things. Number one, it is not true that because she was number one, she was good in everything. One of the things you are likely to know is that she is gifted upstairs, but she is lazy. The one who was number number who was, who was not even you are not even mentioning may have worked much harder than this one, and yet this one who is lazy got better marks. Does that happen? Many of the A group people don't work as hard as the B. Am I right? Now, so who needs to be congratulated? The one who I used to argue with my, my children that I cannot congratulate you where you are not good. If you are not born all the time, it's because God gave you a clever head. So who should get the congratulations? God. Am I communicating? So why should I give you, why should I give you a prize that belongs to God? So we are giving them when they were very young. And my, my last born finished university 07, so I'm not talking about currently. But uh, when they were young, we are giving all of them. I will not give you any prize. I, all the gifts I bought was for effort. Because that one is you. If you are a B, you could become a name by effort, isn't it? So, I always gave a big price for improvement. How do I calculate improvement? What did you get term one? What did you get term two? Then we sit together with them and calculate. Percentage? Improvement. And the one with the biggest percentage improvement gets the highest price. Now you realize, if you are number one, how do you improve? Now you really understand that the, the one who is always number one has a lower improvement rate than the one who is number one with number back. So now the one who the other families are loving it is the one who gets my, if I'm giving 500 shillings, that's the one who gets 500 shillings, when the other one gets only 200. The clever one gets 200. The foolish one gets 500. Because you are now not congratulating people for what God gave them. You are congratulating them for what they did with what God yeah. gave them. And they grew like that up to the time they, they went to university and I stopped doing it. That, that you do not congratulate people for what God can do. And that and did. You congratulate them for their own effort. So it's improvement. And so what I'm trying to encourage you on this point is that you need to understand that people are good. So the, the, the first reason I'm telling you is people do not, do not look just at the, the, performance, the performance. It may be a gift. The second thing I want you to understand is even this number one from number ten from the back there is something they do well. For example, some of those people who are, who are not that good and clever, when you take them to the kitchen, they wash the plates, and the mother of the house knows that if, are, if I don't want to be embarrassed before the others, so and so is the only one who can wash to my satisfaction. But you know, there are no prizes for washing plates. <laughs> you, need to, you need to understand, only number one is given a prize for clever. But people with good hands, it's not a gift. Yes. Now, how come we don't give them gifts? You don't, do you normally give your children gifts for washing plates well? And you know there is one child who works better than? So if you must give for class performance, also give for washing plates or even cooking. There's one who cooks ugali and everybody knows. So and so is one who cooks ugali today. Because the taste of the ugali is fed you. No other child can cook ugali like that. And you don't give him a price. The only price parents want to give is? Now but God created us with different gifts, isn't it? Now and you need everybody. You know, it's my wife who, my wife who teaches in university, and she said she read somewhere that uh, the, there was a, a convocation, people coming back to the university from who had gone through the university, and somebody talking said, 
My professors, I want you to know that when, when you are teaching your group, you need to be especially kind and especially careful as you deal with your A students. Because those are the people who will replace you as professors. So treat them well. Because otherwise how will you be replaced? But, number two, but I also want you to know, you must treat well your C grade. Because they are very important. Those are the people who come to fund your university construction. <laughs> and he said it can be proved that most of the tycoons that normally give to the reconstruction of the university were never number one in the university. Because they became number one in thought, isn't it? And the salary wasn't that much. You can't ask them to give much. But this guy with a C graduated, became a businessman. He is no longer a millionaire. He is a billionaire. So when he ties even 1%, the whole block is built. <laughs> so I'm saying, my fellow teachers, if you really want the future of your university, treat the C grade with a special concern if you want your university to continue being constructed. Am I communicating? So you need to understand that even if you sit in your team, everybody is a gift from God for your team. The only thing is, we tend to pick the talkative one. We, want to, we normally pick the intellectual one and forget everybody else. So, what we are talking about in this collaboration is to really go an extra mile to start thinking, what is it I can do to discover the gifts of other people? So that although they don't have the obvious gift, what is the hidden gift that can help? Remember that's what we are saying, it's a transformational thing. And this C is critical for transformation. It is that when you pull everybody, you get better results when you work together. But that will not be possible if you believe that the only people are the three. All the other five are useless. And as I talk like that, I'm sure you are picturing in your leadership. Who in the team have you been ignoring? And what have been the result of your ignoring them? And only celebrating. Remember our talk this morning? Celebrating only the ones who is producing a certain thing. You need to be wider to look at all the task requires and what each one of the people can actually produce. Even if people who do medicine normally are in, they still need somebody else to treat them, isn't it? And um, like I was arguing, sometimes you are doing the other day I was talking to a, to a doctor who with, with a doctor actually a, a specialist consultant. And uh, we, we met and I was, we, uh, our chat was changing services. And he's saying, I'm so unhappy that the 8 o'clock service is not, has, uh, is being removed. I said, why? You know, I normally go there so that I can go, I can go for the rest of the day to go to check my patients. I said, you have no Sabbath. <laughs> the wife was there. He said, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> he has no Sabbath. And so she is like a provoker. her. She says, you know, this guy will come out of church. That is, the 8 o'clock means they are, they are out, they are out by 9.30. And he says, oh, let's go and check a patient in Rakan. Oh, I have another one. I have been in Nairobi hospital. Since by five o'clock, I'll still be in the vehicle. Talk to him. <laughs> so I've been given a job. In other words, on time management, and now you have to do, that doctor requires help, isn't it? <laughs> so that, although I don't have the gift of medicine, <laughs> I can teach him a bit of time management. Now, th what I'm trying to get you to understand is that when you sit there thinking, I'm a doctor consultant, never asking somebody to sit with you and try to look at the day with you to see what can be done and what cannot be done. The next, the next time I like talking to people about their day, I, I met somebody who worked in a hotel. And I said, oh, how is church? She says, Mr. Nganga, <laughs> you talk about church. Do we go to church? We in all in, in, in the hotel industry. It's impossible. I said, are you serious? Oh, we can never go to church. Sunday is the PSCS day. We don't go to church. So I said, I will see your boss. Because if you go to hell, you can use him as a defense. <laughs> He's the one who prevented you going to church all your life. So I was, and by the way, I was serious. I was going to see the hotel manager about it. But as I was saying, I said, exactly how do you report? He said he was there last night. He was in the hotel last night. And Saturday night he was also very busy. Then now I have just come at 12. I said, what did you say? So you have a roster. So those who came early in the morning have gone, isn't it? Yes. And you come at 12. So why did you go to church? You don't have the debate change. Because it has nothing to the hotel. 
the guy is the one who never went. Was only a church at 8 o'clock. And he would have gone to eight, come out at 9 and come to work at 12, isn't it? I said, and you, if you are really that desperate, you don't have to stick to a church that's no 8 o'clock service. Go to another one where there is 8 o'clock. And I could see the guy was in utter shock. He had been so pleased, I'm going to see the boss. Until the subject came to himself. <laughs> it is himself that is not organized. I'm not communicating. So what I'm saying is, is that although some of those things are common sense, you realize common sense is not yet common. So you have to spend a bit of time as a leader. If you just do the normal thing as a leader, you always ignore people who are not, whose gifts don't quickly show up. So you must go below your surface level to look for those people, because they are there. Like at least I'm, I'm hoping I'm going the next time in that hotel, I'll, I'll check whether he has started attending church. Because he sounded like he had given up. In fact, he told me, I mean, he was so encouraged, he even stopped now serving others just to talk to me. Just to tell me how, before he started entering all industry, he was in the choir, he was in the leader. Brother Nanya was so committed until these people took me. Now, <laughs> but now I changed it. It is him to organize his time. Go to church fellowship and in the afternoon come to. And I told him when they put you morning duty, I can take you to an evening service. At the Baptist Church, at all say there are churches in this town that have six o'clock service. And you can actually go there. But you need to think. Are we together? I'm using that story to just tell you. There is something good in the other team, in the other team member. But you may have to work to find it. And when you discover it, your team will achieve more. Because everybody will pull his weight. So even a doctor requires the help of others. So however good you are, there is a part of you. There is a part of the task in the team that cannot be done by your type of skills. You require somebody, somebody else. Another good for thought. They achieve the most who do not mind who gets the credit. Why do you think people don't collaborate? I'm suggesting to you the reason why collaboration is not easy is exactly the same reason why celebration is not easy. Jealousy. Selfishness. Like for example, let's say you are, a, you, are a, you are pastors in a town. If you collaborate, you can divide up the place and achieve much more. Around 1925, the churches, the first church in Kenya was 1844. So, the, for about 50 years, they never achieved very much in the country. By around 1920s, they, all the Protestant churches decided they are better off collaborating. That's that why they formed an mutual of the ministry, Alliance of Protestant Churches. You have heard of it. And what did they achieve in the process? What is one institution they achieved in the process? Alliance High School. Because in their small, small primary school they were starting, they could never make enough study eight to go to a high school. But once they put one school, then the students were sent from all mission schools throughout the country in order to get for the boys at Alliance. And uh, I hear those days, even girls went to Alliance boys. You know, <laughs> at, 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 at the beginning, at least we are told Ma Margaret Kenyatta was, uh, was in a boys' school when she, went to, when she went to high school. All I'm trying to get you to understand is this thing about collaboration. It's not the first time it has been done. When it was done, the results were outstanding. The BCA gave land at Kikuyu, and many, many things happened in the process. So let me ask, do many churches collaborate today? Most of them are looking at what is in it for me. Why, how am I going to get, how would our church, in fact, the other day, I heard about a crusade that was being organized. And somebody, one church said, if you do not accre accredit us with the results, we are not coming. <laughs> in other words, the only way they can participate is for their, to their name to be at the top of the, of, of the banner. And when you put the name, this name, you know if there are six names, one will be at the bottom. So it's not ours at the bottom. <laughs> Yet it's obvious one of them has to be at the bottom. Now, I can tell you, looking for credit will kill collaboration. They achieve most who do not mind who gets the credit. And the same thing with your team. If you do not want anybody but the team leader to get the credit, what happens? Everybody says, okay, to only the end. And I'm sure don't pretend you have never been a team like that. 
When the team leader is so domineering, the rest of them watch to see where he will, he will go. Does the team achieve much? What happens to the team members is they do their minimum allowable. <laughs> and let him do everything he wants to do. Let's see, two or two. They are part of the team, but they will be very disappointed if he wins. <laughs> because obviously, when you start saying that, you, you hope you will not achieve, and you hope your wishes will, will happen. The team will not achieve much. Because you want to teach your leader a lesson, isn't it? Do you know that leader could be seated here? Where people are planning, especially now that you are away. Amen. Let's talk. Si no na kila kitu anataka kufanya peke yake, tumwachie. Tuona kule ata ataenda. Because if you don't know how to recognize people and how to admit there are things in you that you cannot, and you know sometimes I can be difficult, you know, just to, to admit to you, I did do engineering, but my last job. I was the operation manager for Shell. I was in the leadership team of the company. As an operation manager, every, every manager, every department manager who reported to me was an engineer, and I was not. Now, you know you are likely to, to feel like intimidated, isn't it? Now, actually, a lot of people now address me as engineer. I keep telling them I'm not. <laughs> but I didn't do it. But what happened is, over time, my skills that are required were seen by the company as the skills that are required, the people skills, the management skills, and they realize engineers given a good team can achieve much, isn't it? So, and that gift I think the company was trying to recognize is my ability to work with people that are better than me. The fact that I know I, I can't give that engineering solution, but I know this young man who is half my age 10. So I called him and said, please explain to me, how do we design this thing? And of course, a young man is very happy to be teaching a muse, isn't he? <laughs> that guy was sleep really happy. I talked to the manager. <laughs> Do you know the result of my department? My division achieves a lot, but it's not through me. I don't even understand the things they are telling me. <laughs> am I communicating? I am willing to sit down and learn. Because I know they know something I don't know. But when you start thinking that because you are the leader, you know everything. You can't achieve much. Or maybe you are leading a team that is the best team south of the Sahara, north of the Limpopo. You know, <laughs> you don't like comparing yourself with South Africa and the Arabs. So you say, my team is the best north of the Limpopo, south of the Sahara. Sahara. I agree, you are big. So you can't collaborate with anybody. What you don't know is, although your team is the very top, chances are that there is another team that is not at the top overall. But in certain things they do so well, you can never match. Is that possible? Yeah. You know, I am not a football fan. I did not stay last night, the late, last, late, late on Saturday night. Is that Sunday night when the finals were being played? Yeah. I never stayed late. I just want to see the result. <laughs> the, the idea of sitting there just watching to 22 men chasing one ball. <laughs> I'm not good at it. But I was listening to people reviewing the game. You know, dozing on Monday morning. <laughs> they told me, oh my. Because you see, some people are following the elephant. And they really wanted the elephant to win. Why? Because some of their best players in the European Cup were in, in the elephant, isn't it? The Zambia did not even have one name anybody has ever heard of. They simply, they simply don't seem to have anybody who is a foreign player. So are just local young boys. Am I right? So, even as the elephant went to the field, they knew the Zambians cannot match them. None of them has ever played top flight football. They just did it, boys. <laughs> but by the end of the game, they went crying, not spiritual tears, but physical tears. <laughs> what was the lesson between the two teams? Here were 11 boys who all thought they don't know, so they have the need one, another. Here were another 11 who each knew how to play. And each one of them wanted to be the best goaler of the match. So in trying not to work together, what happened to the, could they score? Are you getting the point? Now if so, if you can't learn about collaboration anywhere else, learn it from the Africa Cup. <laughs> <laughs> that the team, not equally qualified, but able to play together, won a team 
that had the best footballers of the whole world, but working singly. Am I, am I right in my assumption? Yes. So that's what really we are saying. That even if your team is not very good, whilst they learn how to corroborate, you achieve most when you do not mind who gets a credit. So ask yourself, is that the reason why your church can never corroborate with that other church? Or your whatever, I don't know which area of leadership, you are, your community cannot corroborate with another community. Your company cannot corroborate with another company because you think you are the very best or because you think you will not get to become famous. If, you, if what you are really after is not your name becoming big, but your community going far, it will be important that you ignore the credit, who gets the credit, and find out who gets more. Because you see, if back to Jesse Mozinga's um, double strength with me, if he feels like surely, I can't, I can't do it with the ganga. He is too small. He will keep with his 20, and I'll keep my 10. The 23 he was supposed to get, is he going to get it? No. no. If you don't care that Nanga is also gaining, because the selfishness is the problem. Hey, I'm helping Nanga to get 12. No, I would rather, I would rather not get 3. <laughs> is that the way people argue? Yeah, that's why they cannot cooperate. Because in the process of us getting bigger, even the small one will get bigger. And you don't want him to get the big. Although you also getting even more benefit. It will be important for us to look to look at that. So it will be important then for us to finish and I'm summarizing what I've been saying so far. That cooperative leadership is about synergy. That it entails forming alliances between groups. An alliance between groups that are doing something which can help each other. Each group of functioning self-sufficiently. In other words, you are recognizing this group can work alone, and this can work alone. They don't actually need each other. But you are saying you want to have an alliance. Because by doing alliance, whatever they do, and whatever we are doing, the result will bring this energy. The extra result because of working together. But the first thing is, do not first of all be sure that this group can work alone. And be sure this can work alone. So that as you have alliances, it's not because one group needs the other. It's because both of you need each other. That's what, what the collaboration is. Collaboration is not, uh, it's not between the company and a, a department. The department cannot exist alone. It is between uh, two complete companies working together. For greater, the reason you are coming together is for greater achievement through collaboration than the sum of the individual to get something bigger than the sum of individual achievements. Therefore, collaborative leadership requires knowing intimately your mission. So the first thing, and I will repeat it during this afternoon, do not collaborate with a group whose vision and mission, values and strategic objectives are not known to you. But number two, do not collaborate with another group until you know what your vision, mission and strategies and values are. Why? You can collaborate with somebody who is going to Garissa <laughs> with, because you did not look clear where he was going. But because you are following the superhighway, it's called Zika, Zika Zuka superhighway, not realizing at Zika the guy will branch. So you end up in Garissa and you want to, to go to Isiolo. Am I communicating? So first of all, sit down and find out where do I want to go? I actually want to go to Isiolo. But we can help each other up to Vika. We can help each other up to where? To Vika. We can help. So, it will mean that you'll be looking for Vika. When Vika reaches, he say, Hallelujah, you have been helpful to me, but not anymore. Go your way and I go my way. So, can you see why we are saying collaboration is not, should never happen before you do self evaluation? What's my vision? What does my group want to achieve? What's my mission? How are we going to achieve? Because you see, vision is a noun, what you hope to achieve at the end. Mission is a verb, what you hope to do to achieve that vision. And then, top values are the boundaries. In other words, as I go to my vision and mission, I can't go out there here, here. Values are non-negotiable assumptions. In other words, we don't discuss it. In other words, I want to go this way, 
but not this. You know, you need to know that because you might end up in an alliance with someone who doesn't agree with your values, isn't it? So you frustrate him, isn't it? Because when you say, do this and I do this, he goes bribing and you don't believe in bribery. <laughs> Are we together? <laughs> Although some people, some people don't mind collaborating with someone who bribes so that they will say, me, it's not me bribing, it's the other but surely, why did you go around having an alliance with a corruption guy? <laughs> you should have analyzed before, isn't it? You know, somebody the other day in one of our meetings called it uh, sub subcontracting corruption. <laughs> in other words, I don't want to do it myself, so I allow somebody else to do it for, for me. And if you are, are you corrupt? Me? No, check me, audit me. And if you audit him, there is no way he doesn't. But he has a lot of contractors who are going to do the bribing. Like you want your goods to come from Mombasa and you do for the most corrupt clearing forwarding agent. Now you ask, are you corrupt? No. How do your goods come? I don't know. I normally pay this guy. Not knowing very well that part of the payment, part of it is his cost, the other part is the bribe, paid in one check. <laughs> so you are subcontracting corruption. It's, uh, to use the better word is outsourcing. It's not the term they normally use. <laughs> You are outsourcing corruption. So in your in your in your collaboration, please check who you are and who you are collaborating with, because they might have core values that completely exclude them from collaborating with you. Number two, if they are going to Garissa, but there is a branching off at Kangudo, then there isn't much to trouble with them, isn't it? So again, because of the direction they are going and where you are going. You don't go with them. So you need to know their vision. Where, not where they are going currently. Where do they hope to arrive at the end? It's important to know that. Because currently you are going together. Not knowing that, that uh, uh, just by Umoja you will go one direction and you go another different direction. Find out from the group. Where do you want to go finally? Where does he actually want to go? So that's the first important thing in collaboration. Checking, knowing intimately your own mission, vision, value, and strategy and objective. And then being open to new avenues towards the fulfillment of that mission through others. In other words, having done number one, you know your vision, you know your mission. And you know his vision and his mission. The next thing you must do is to start being open minded. There is a way we do things different from the way you do things, but none of them is wrong, it's just different. Are we together? So, you can be fighting about nothing. Well, it's only they do it this way and we do it this way. Just because of the different methodology, that should not stop you from collaborating. Because the thing that should stop you collaborating is if the vision and mission are different and the core values are different. Methodologies. You might even learn that their way of doing things is cheaper than your way, isn't it? So, should you refuse to collaborate? No. You are going to gain. Certain things they do better than you and they do cheaply compared to you, certain other things you do better than them, and so you are going to collaborate. So you are saying, be open-minded to see that although these other people are doing it differently from you, there is something you can gain by working with them. And then, do not be chaotic. One of the marks of a cult is that the only ones, if you ever hear a church which tells you we are the only ones right, by the way, it's not a cult by one difference. You need three or four items. But that's not my topic today. But at least one thing that is very true of all cults is they believe they are the only ones. Right, I still remember as a young man going for a meeting in the Hilton. Anyway, we, those days were very difficult to go to the Hilton in the 70s. And uh, there was a, this Muzungu, and he was going to pay for us to go for a meeting in the Hilton. As a young man in the 70s, I felt surely chance to go to the Hilton. And he went there and you're having him talk, and he told us what he has brought us has never been heard of in Africa. Yeah? I wanted to listen clear to hear this message that has never been heard in Africa. And so he told us all churches are on the Broadway. He was the only one who has come with a narrow way. I listened more. At the end, I didn't hear anything new. That's the last time I entered that meeting. So it was gone for several weeks. I didn't go to the meeting again. Because that's the way you know account. Where everybody else is wrong, they are the only ones right. And if that be the truth, you cannot collaborate. Because you cannot collaborate with someone who is wrong. So you must assume that although he's different from you, he's not wrong. 
So what I'm saying here is collaboration requires that you open up your mind to see something better in others. So for example, one of the critical problems in the government of Kenya is tribalism. What is tribalism? We are the only one right. All others are wrong. So that you just hear, so as president, hopeless, this country is going to the dogs. N not because of anything he has done, but they come from the wrong tribe. That's basically what the problem is. Where you assume you are the only ones right, all the others are wrong. Collaboration requires that you understand, although they are different, there is something in them that can contribute to the team. And there is also something you can contribute, but not everything. And that's what we are here saying. Do not be counted. Be open. You know, corruption is building on a foundation of networking. With the knowledge of an openness toward outside organizations and people. In other words, you want to network with anybody outside yourself who can contribute to your vision and mission. You know where you are going? Your interest is anybody who can help you to go there. You are willing to network with them. To collaborate with them. And you foster harmonious living with competitors and opponents. So when you are talking about collaboration, immediately they are even with opponents. There are things you can do together. I worked for oil industry for 30 years or so. And um, one of the things, you, you when you were CR7, seven, seven oil companies, competition was very, very tough. Very, very tough. People, very, 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 people don't realize that when they look, they think we are, we are colluding. <laughs> but the truth is, the reality is, I mean, when I was, there was a time I was in charge of aviation, and Kenya Airways and Defense were the, like that 100% of local aviation market. You really felt like, and you knew that if you lost uh, Kenya Airways, you have lost your job. Because it was 17% of the total sales. So if you lose it, nobody will keep you as a company. So each time I, was, I went voting, I was like my legs having fellowship. Because you were worried about what can, what can happen. Now, at that point, you see anybody else visiting Kenya Airways and you want to change his dental formula. How could he visit your customer? What are you doing there? And you start realizing you cannot collaborate because you see them as a threat. Then I discovered there are areas you can collaborate even if you decide not to collaborate on others. For example, on safety. We should not compete on safety, isn't it? And you realize if you work together. And so in later years, I discovered that companies can come together and I started bringing oil companies together to talk about issues. Not of sales, that the salesmen can compete. But in terms of safety, we can talk about what is it that you know that's helping you to be safer than me. And I also tell, tell you what is it I'm doing that can help you. And I started holding meetings together to talk about road safety, to talk about depot safety. And people say, wow, yeah, come to think of it. Initially it was very difficult until one day a ship called Suneta, 1990. I was then, I, was then, I became district manager at the beginning of the night, about 20 something years ago. And, um, and I, 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 a ship came to Mombasa, was just about to dock in Kipebu, called, the ship was called Suneta, and it hit something, and we feared it was going to open up. That's about 8 million liters waiting to split. And that's when each company realized if this thing pours its oil on the ocean, it will, it will swell the whole thing from Dar es Salaam right up to Mogadishu. And so all companies started to coming together to see how do we deal with this? How do we check from underneath? Of course, we all, we called for help from London and then finally the experts from London came and helped us and floated the ship and it went into harbor and removed the thing. By the time the ship left, the whole industry were not needing to be encouraged. They all came. They said, if Shell, the biggest oil company, was having a challenge, what about us? Let's begin something. And we called it OSMAC, Oil Spill Mutual Aid Group. It's still existing up to today. I was involved in information 20 years ago. Because everybody realized that if a big problem comes, nobody can handle it alone. And so OSMAC started. Even after now, the government, the oil companies use their own money to prepare. And they keep doing exercises. They pretend a ship is about to break up and you come with the equipment, I come with you. We bring all equipment together and see how can we handle it together. That's called collaboration. Currently, there's another one I'm, I'm handling as a consultant because these days I do consultancy. The whole companies have asked me to 
they have said they are, they are trying to deal with the with the fires. You remember the fires along the road with the vehicles bringing trouble, and they have given me a consult as they are moving from town to town, where I am talking to the people around the area of how to handle how to handle petrol tanker accidents, and we are creating training a group of people that can come for first aid. Saint John Saint John is also helping us, but I'm. They are handling the first aid side and I'm handling how to do the fire and how to prepare for an, em an emergency. And I'm spending, I'm spending for one time, one group after the other. I've done the Nairobi one. The other day I was at uh, Kenungi. Kenungi. We are moving from place to place. Again, <laughs> I was even very surprised because the one I was handling in, Kano in, Ken Kenu in, um, in Kagemi, the managers were knock. The one I handled in uh, the group I was training in, in uh, Kenungi, the handlers were Ken Okobiru. And the other, the one that was gave me was being done in a shelf situation, but being managed by, being managed by Nock. And I said, how can you manage the training in somebody else's petrol station? Says we are not in this matter. We are not competing. We have created various stopping every so many kilometers throughout the country on the major north, 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 north what is it called? Northern corridor. They have created various places where they must train people. You can go 20 kilometers this way, 20 kilometers this way, and you can deal with an emergency as soon as possible to know how to handle the oil that has built. And uh, it doesn't matter. So what they have done is to allocate each other. You are located here, the next company here, the next company there, and it doesn't matter even if it happens that the, con the, the place where the training is happening is in somebody's home. So it's, it's not an example of collaboration, because they have realized that none of them alone, like you can't have all those trainings throughout the country. But if Shell is handling here, Kenner will handle here, and Total will handle here, at the end you have covered the country, isn't it? That's what you are talking about. And you need to ask in your own area, how, even if you are great competitors, in which area can you compete without compromising your competition? Am I communicating? So, so, and I'm using that example to just help you. I you may not know in your particular area. With Ariu, because here the emphasis I'm giving is, you are not stopping competing. You still compete. But you know where you want to go, you know where you want to go. On certain areas you cannot compete. Like I told you, for example, in pricing. If you actually have a court discussing prices, the Anti-Monopolist Act in Kenya will jail you. So that area is not that. You cannot see to say, what price should we... No, that one you'll be caught. But if you are discussing how to reduce, to reduce the number of deaths, will the government mind? No. So that's basically what I'm saying. You need to check, even if you're an NGO, I'm an NGO, and we are all helping the poor. <laughs> you know that's what the NGOs are even on here. They are all trying to help Madare, but they are competing in Madare and fighting each other. You sponsor this child, then the child goes and cheats the other one. And the sponsor. One child is sponsored by three people. Because they don't know about each other. They don't corroborate. Am I right? Or because of lack of exchanging data. Because why should you waste your money on one child when there are so many children who are all needing help because of lack of collaboration? So even an SGO, you need to find what is it that you could benefit by working together. And you cannot get it by working alone. That's what we are really 